Hi everyone and welcome to another salon in our Play UK series of digital events. For those joining us for the first time, let me explain that Play UK is a platform that encourages collaboration between artists and IT professionals and provides learning, mentoring and networking opportunities to the game development community in the region. This year, Play UK is entirely online and its program brings together creatives working in video games from across the UK and the Western Balkans. Tonight we have a pleasure of having Gabrielle Jenks, Digital Director for Manchester International Festival, as our guest. We will be talking about the festival's recent digital commission, Your Progress Will Be Saved. But before we hand it over to Gabrielle, we have some important news to share um, with you regarding our program. So let's hear it from Marie Folston, uh, this year's uh, Play UK curator. Marie, what have you got to tell us? Thanks, you bet. Well, I've got some exciting news that um, as part of Play UK this year, we are really pleased to announce the launch of a brand new mentorship scheme. Uh, this is a scheme that we're starting in January next year, and it's a three month program that seeks to pair 10 emerging video game creatives from across the Western Balkans and the wider European area with 10 specially selected video game industry mentors from across the UK. And those mentors come from companies that include spaces such as Mediatonic, Unity Technologies and Us2 Games. Uh, program participants taking part in the mentorship scheme will receive eight hours of one-to-one -one mentoring sessions. They'll take part in playful online social events, as well as having the opportunity to, to showcase their work with audiences from around the world in a virtual event that will be taking place in spring 2021 as part of Play UK. If you're interested in joining the program, applications are now open and we encourage those working in games from a variety of disciplines. So whether you work in design, programming, narrative design, production, art or community development, um, we encourage you all to apply. We're looking for individuals who might be just starting out in games, those who are perhaps early in their careers, or equally those who are seeking to support, uh, seeking support to help identify and work towards new goals and ambitions. So as I say, applications are open now for people interested in taking part, and they're going to close at 5 p.m. Central European time on Thursday, 10th of December. So you've got until then to submit your application. So there's just over two weeks to apply to the program, but the application process is something that we've driven to sort of make and ensure that it's sort of relatively simple to apply. Um, we're going to post, post a link to further details about the program in the chat window. I'll figure out where exactly in a few moments. So if you're interested in taking part, then follow the link. You'll be able to find full details uh, about the program, a link to the application form, uh, and also details about the program's amazing lineup of mentors and a full list of countries uh, where, which are eligible, eligible to uh, participate in. So yes, so that's our brand new news for this week. Um, but for now, of course, back to the main event and back to Gabrielle Jenks, who we are, as, as, as Yubita said, really, really thrilled to welcome this week to talk about her work, uh, working around sort of curation and commissioning with exhibitions and virtual worlds and video games, all subjects that are very, very close to my heart. So I'd like to hand over now to Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, yeah, thank you to the British Council for asking me to, to speak. Right, let me try and share my screen. Just one moment. So. So hello, everyone. And um, yeah, just a quick intro into what we're going to talk about today. So um, I'm going to give you a bit of background around me, about who I am, what I do, what my interests are, and then, as Marie was saying, give you a um, deep dive into one of our projects we've just started commissioning. So um, this is, here we go, a bit about me. So um, to give you some background, um, the past 15 years, yes, I'm that old, um, I've been working um, across the arts, but I'm really interested in site-specific curation. So um, this means context-specific work where artists are responding to the environment, both in the physical and in the online space. So prior to joining Manchester International Festival, which is a festival I work for now, I ran a roaming festival called Abandoned Normal Devices for 10 years which uh, travel to different locations, um, both 
urban, rural, underground, virtual, subterranean. Um, and it was a programme that was interrogating our assumptions around contemporary culture, but inviting new ways to see the world through technology. Um, and that kind of thinking which we applied to the landscape, you can see there's a project here in the corner, which was a virtual reality piece. Um, we also applied to the online space. And this is quite an old work now, but I think it really translates to this, this site-specific curation. Uh, which is Molia Industria, a video game designer um, who um, uh, developed the, this iPhone game, which was um, actually made for the iPhone. It was about the ethics around manufacturing for the iPhone um, and subsequently it was banned by the iPhone. Um, but I was really interested in online spaces and actually how you can use them as a site to respond to and other examples of works over the years are we've I've done commissions which are films that have been released through the dark net, which are looking specifically at things like anonymity and censorship. So really interested in people, place and their community and thinking about how that translates both in physical and online contexts. So what I do now, as I was saying, is um, I, I've moved uh, from abandoned normal devices to a festival in the UK called Manchester International Festival. Um, and this is um, a huge festival um, that launched back in 2007. It's an artist-led festival, so um, it's one of those rare festivals that speaks to artists and allows them to do whatever they want to do. It's it's, it's about an artist's idea and bringing that to life. Um, it's uh, We commission work that sits across the spectrum of performing arts, visual arts and, and popular culture. And to give you a sort of sense of the scale, um, we have over 300,000 audiences coming to the festival biennially and then that work often tours then throughout the world. Um, so the kind of artists that we've worked with historically include people like Marina Abramovich to Damon Albarn to theatre companies like Punch Drunk. And um, I specifically run a team, uh, quite a small team, but where we work on the digital projects. And uh, there we think about how we um, embed pioneering technologies into works, but also born digital productions, commissioning work, which is, um, from, from the very beginning about thinking about digital technologies on scale, but also responding to technology and how technology is shaping our environment. So this is a um, brief overview of some of the projects we've commissioned over the past couple of years. Um, Rafael Zanahema was a, was a project that we worked on back in 2019, and he's a Mexican-Canadian artist who for many years has been developing deeply complex, large scale installations, which um, really talk about the biases which underlie algorithms and machine vision. And he did a huge work for us, which is now actually touring around the world and, and should be in Montreal next year. Um, Laurie Anderson, who you may know of, um, and uh, Laurie Anderson came and presented her work to the moon, which is a really beautiful virtual reality piece, which is a great example actually of world building and way in which the tools of games design uh, can be used to build environments that underpin a story world and um, it's extremely meditative um, experience. And we've, we've also had an ongoing relationship with Bjork and been touring her virtual reality works um, around the world over the past couple of years. And Marshmallow Laser Feast. Marshmallow Laser Feast are a great interactive design studio who've been developing beautiful virtual reality works and we're launching a project with them and the RSC and uh, Philharmonia, London Philharmonia next year. So when we when we develop productions, we are often looking for uh, artists who ask really much bigger questions about how technology is shaping the world. And um, because of this, we were really keen to, to start commissioning video games. And when we did this, we wanted to also think about underrepresented voices in the video games community. Um, so most of our commissions so far have been actually female led. And the first one was by Nina Freeman. And this was actually before I joined Manchester International Festival. Um, but if you don't know Nina Freeman, a lot of her work is very autobiographical. It strongly draws on um, her own life and experiences. And, and the work that she did for us is the video game is called LostMemories.net. And it harks back to this early 2000s where Freeman was a young girl. She was discovering the twin joys of being online and creating websites. So as a player, you, you take on this role of the young Freeman building both this relationship um, and, and the website online. And this narrative then grows over as the game goes on. 
so when we presented the work in the festival, obviously the game was released online, uh, but we also de uh, developed this installation where you could actually go and play the game in this exhibition, which was a recreation of, of, of her bedroom, um, which is actually really sweet. It was hugely popular. Um, ooh, and then also um, Paloma Dawkins. Um, so Paloma Dawkins is uh, another great um, uh, video games developer who's from Canada and is really known for these re amazing hallucinogenic um, psychedelic video games. Um, and she was really interested in developing these fractal, interactive fractals that played with music and electronic music and have these seeped throughout this video video game. In fact, if I just show you the next piece here, you'll see that this is actually the game, Songs of the Lost. So this is quite an incredible uh, collaboration with the music uh, composer Jolene, who's amazing. Uh, if you haven't heard her work, it's, um, it's, it's a middle, like a kind of deep techno. And uh, it's a project that very much is looking at how technology, uh, we put too much trust in technology. Um, so it was a really new adventure for Paloma developing this piece of work with a musician. Um, and it, it, what was quite fascinating about it was they all ended up as a, as a live performance within the, within the festival. So we learned a lot with two of these projects. Um, and I think one of the things that we felt that as we developed projects going forward, it'd be good to evaluate where we got to with those. So some of the things that we learned included, you know, there was a really interesting interplay with, with the physical manifestation of games and having exhibitions and, and, and also concerts. Um, and there was loads of enthusiasm from musicians um, to collaborate on on um, on video games. So actually, we thought this is a this is an area of, of great development. We should we should think about this going forward. Um, but there was challenges for us in the fact that as a really big festival that celebrates lots of different kinds of art forms, um, things can get video games can get lost. And actually, with a traditional marketing team, which is you know what we have. Um, uh, and a PR team delivering campaigns that um, can really meet and reach those audiences is actually quite challenging for us. Um, and also downloading video games, um, that was a barrier. So we've been looking at different ways in which we can not only position this kind of work, and I'd be really interested to get other people's opinions on this in, when, we, when we talk in the Q&A, and how best we can profile this kind of work and in what kind of physical context they can be best manifest. Um, so actually some of that thinking has really informed um, Virtual Factory, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. And um, this is a set of, of projects and, and commissions which uh, are going to be released over the next year. Um, and they're really responding to um, this building here. Um, and this building is actually uh, being constructed in the city of Manchester at the moment, um, and it's going to be the home to the festival. And it's um, designed by the architect Rem Koulas. It's going to be one of his first cultural spaces in the UK. Um, and it's um, sited in a really interesting part of the city. So uh, it's at the home of what was Granada TV, um, television studios. And it's next to um, a really well established science and industry, industry museum. So um, just to give you a sort of sense of the scale, this is it here. So it's over 13,000 square meters. Um, it's gonna have state of the art technology and it's really an open space for experimentation and, um, and yeah, we're super excited about what we can, what we can develop there. And um, I'm just gonna show you a picture so you can actually See in construction, there it is. So this is this is this is happening right now. It has been slowed down a little bit uh, due to COVID, but you can see here the um, old industrial um, uh, train line that that used to be uh, go through Manchester. And I'll just show you another one. Yeah, and then you sort of start seeing the main warehouse space. Um, so it's actually going to be one of the largest venues in Europe and here it is here. 
So one of the things we started thinking about as we've been constructing that space is actually this the strange time that we're constructing this venue and and actually the, the fact that more people are actually increasingly taking spending more time in non-physical contexts, now whether that's through social media or through video games. And so one of the things we wanted to explore was actually what does a blended program look like where actually there isn't this digital dualism where things sit in the online space and other other work sit in the physical space. And I think um, one of the things we were really keen to think about also is how could we expand on definitions of architecture? So this was a program that we started to develop pre-lockdown, but it certainly was really influenced by um, some of what we experienced in lockdown as, as these works went into commission. Um, so we've commissioned four artists um, to really expand on these definitions of virtual architecture. Um, and that's, I mean, we've, we've, we've chosen artists that really construct new worlds, the alternate realities, they're um, using the site and the construction of this new cultural space as a starting point from which to develop an idea. Um, so we launched uh, the program in July and uh, they give you a sense of some of the artists we're speaking to. Um, the first artist is the project I'm going to dig a little bit deeper on, uh, which is by um, Latobo Avadon, who's the avatar here on, on the left. And um, <clears throat> Latobo is really known um, as a, a virtual avatar that shapeshifts through the digital realm and in, in particular using multiplayer games such as Second Life and Final Fantasy to deliver performances. So things you, we thought it should be perfect for this kind of uh, project. Um, and then Taishani, who is a Turner Prize winning um, artist who crafts these really dark, fantastical worlds, drawing on forgotten histories and uh, using archive footage, but sculpture and writing. Um, and then Jen Nikiru, who's known for these very powerful films on blackness and black identity. And lastly, Robert Yang, um, who is a games designer who, who you may know of um, and an artist who has created a series of acclaimed video games on gay culture and intimacy and I think more importantly has also really pushed what is tolerated and, and allowed in, in video games and so we've been having some really good conversations with him about queer architecture in particular and also how cities have changed and been gentrified over the years. So. The first project, which is by La Turbo Avedon, actually there was a lot of thinking that we brought to that. And when we started talking to them, we were quite inspired by um, the rise in virtual tourism. So um, we'd really noticed that games had become, like so many of us, had, um, had become more immersive, higher quality, more cinematic. And um, in this development, I think really became apparent um, when at the end of last year, Rough Guides released this travel guide, uh, which as you probably know is used for ma major cities and locations around the world and very much a, a tourist guide, but released this guide to the Xbox. And we thought this is a really interesting shift that um, actually now you have a, a guide to unforgettable worlds, which aren't actually real worlds, but instead worlds from video games. And so I think what, what this did was it realised this thrill of being somewhere new was no longer the domain of the real world, but you could get that same thrill from being in a game. And so um, while it's not the most detailed book, it was a very useful mechanism for which to talk about the project, especially internally for us um, in the organisation. And so, you know, using in-game photography was taking place, you had virtual travellers snapping away as they play uh, and sharing them on social. And so in the book, it talks through, you know, well-known games like Halo, Assassin's Creed, Tomb Raider. But it, it, I think at the, at the heart of it, when we were thinking about the factory and the space that's being constructed and not quite built, there was actually a really interesting opportunity to think about, actually, could you open the doors ahead of them being built? And actually, what does it mean to bring people on a tour in a, to a building that's already in construction? And how could you beta test the building? before it opened. So, um, and it's interesting for us to think about whether we'd want it to continue beyond um, the building opening. So, and it was also inspired by um, 
artists interventions into game existing game engines or games and um, so um so we've been looking at a lot of virtual tourism and I think actually it's been quite exciting there, but also um, given we also commission visual artists um, and personally, because of my interest in, in sort of context specific curation, I'm, I've been following artists who've been making interventions into existing games and working with those players or or subverting those spaces. Um, and, you know, there's a few examples here, one of which I'm sure you've heard of, which is a Brett Wanabe, um, who you know, modified Grand Theft Auto Five by introducing this deer running through the streets. And you know what was really fascinating about that project is that this game that had been known for human, <laughs> for humans amongst many things, everyone became focused on this on this deer. Um, and um, you know, and Chow Fei is another artist who has been you know working on Second Life for many years and really been pushing um, and testing the boundaries between virtual and physical um, a virtual and physical existence in Second Life. And then Corey Archangel, who, um, you know, hacked into Super Mario Brothers and created an installation where he took out, you know, most of, of what you would find in that game other than the clouds. So this kind of subverting of existing games is something just generally really interested in and, and thinking about those games as performance spaces. Um, and all of that thinking was channeled into uh, our conversations with our first project, uh, which is Latobo Avedon's commission, which is called Your Progress Will Be Saved. So um, to give you a bit of background into Latobo's work, um, Latobo is an avatar, a virtual avatar and virtual artist, um, and they create work that emphasizes this practice of non-physical identity and authorship. And they've spent the past decade developing a body of work that really illuminates that ever-growing intensity between a user and their virtual experiences. So they pursue creative environments online that really deepen uh, the meaning of memories found in cyberspace. Um, to show you. So they're really interested in online existence and architecture through software. Um, and you can see this, this is this is their avatar here. Um, and a lot of their work actually you know, manifests in multiplayer games from like Second Life to Minecraft. Um, so, they so they use these tools, computer-based tools, to present themselves within video games. So just show you some of, um, yeah, some of their avatars that's manifested. So these are all the turbo. <laughs> and over the years, and this might be quite complex to understand, but over the years they've extended their work into the physical world too. So they've done shows. Um, and this is a show they did with Hatsune Miku, um, the holographic pop star called Still Be Here. And this this happened in the Barbican in London. Um, and they've been running projects online. Um, Permanent Sunsets is another one where they tour through different virtual worlds and game spaces and encourage you to watch the sunset. Um, so this might seem like quite an odd response to video games, but it gives you a sense of their approach. They have, they're very observational. They like to watch how players observe, uh, play in the game, and they're like flanners. They sort of float around the virtual space and, and observe simulated spaces. And um, this is a quote of theirs around um, Red Dead Redemption 2. So and it, I think it just communicates um, their intention. Recently, I spent several months wandering around inside Red Dead Redemption 2. I enjoyed the main storyline, though I was far more interested in having quiet moments away from all the violence. So you get the sense that they're a real observer of, of these environments and they've really watched different kinds of manifestations of multiplayer games over the years. So it was really through conversation with them that we started talking about what intervention we could make and which, uh, you know, and and what game we may choose. And we also started talking about ideas to do with the metaverse. So um, for any of you who don't know what the metaverse is, um, a recent manifestation that of that is, is Fortnite, but it, it, it could come, yeah, it's broadly understood as um, a kind of persistent shared 3D virtual space, which has, in some senses, its own communications and economy. Um, and it has its origins back in 
uh, Neil Stevenson's um, 1992 science fiction novels, um, Snow Crash, where humans could you know, access a whole virtual universe experience through headsets. And um, more recently, it's in Spielberg's film, um, Ready Player One, where people could uh, um, you know, escape a dystopian uh, world through putting on this virtual reality headset. Um, and this, so, you know, in some senses about pursuing a virtual life and a virtual existence. So we, we were talking about Fortnite. We thought, okay, well, this, this seems quite an interesting space to look at. And, um, and this is what we decided to do. So we actually thought about developing, bringing the factory in to Fortnite Creative, which is actually the sandbox um, element of, of Fortnite, um, and uh, develop an exhibition in the factory and also a really difficult game. Um, and so we really used uh, Fortnite Creative um, as an opportunity to treat the entire island as a kind of all encompassing artwork. Um, so you can sort of see the parameters of it here. I have to say this looks a lot sunnier than Manchester looks and it makes it look like we're in the Costa del Sol, whereas actually it's normally grey and rainy. Um, <laughs> so some of the things that you can do in Fortnite Creative. Um, yeah, and, and in case you don't know what Fortnite Creative is, I'm sure that you do, but um, but it's we used that ever-expanding network of virtual islands which sit alongside the main island um, and and we used that to, to, to construct the work. And one of the reasons we're really interested in it was was partly to do with the scale and the infrastructure behind Fortnite and the fact that they were doing a lot of in-game performances. Um, and, it, and you know, there's, there is something about that, the game engine of Unreal and what you can do um, and what that was allowing some performers to do. And obviously in lockdown, there were various performances from DJ Marshmallow to, to others. So they were also just really curious about the kind of growth of Fortnite. You know, as we can see, 125 million uh, players in less than a year. Uh, it's quite a phenomenon. Um, so this is how you could um, find our island, the factory in Manchester. Um, and we had various conversations about what we should be calling it. Uh, but yeah, we went with Manchester. And this is uh, Laturbo's avatar in Fortnite. Um, and yeah, they chose this skin, which I think is really dazzling and this is them on on, the, on their phone so what was really interesting from day one and um, about working with Lotto Bell um, was that they were an artist who understood curation and how to make artwork but they were actually also really keen gamer um, so it was great to have this balance of somebody who wanted to make uh, a work that would translate to an arts audience but also somebody who also was really interested in a very difficult game uh, where amongst many things you can collect memories. So for us, it really allowed us to, to sort of meet two audiences. Um, but there are various recurring themes, both in the exhibition that we, we created, and I'll talk through that, um, but also in the game itself. So um, some, of the, some of the kind of recurring motifs that you see are their personal computer devices, so screens and phones, and you're often asked to jump through those. Um, and that's because Latobo's work is all about that tension between you and the personal computer. And then secondly, also mirrors in, mi mirrors pop up in different places in the game. Um, and in a way, Latobo wanted the whole uh, production to really operate in this way, to perform as a kind of looking glass, which really asked you, well, invited you to, um, to reflect, but also to ask what you see of your virtual self when you look in the mirror. So for those of you who haven't been into Fortnite Creative and played the game, this is a really quick overview. So it starts in, uh, in a familiar looking apartment in Manchester. Um, and actually through the window there, you can see the factory in the distance. And, uh, and, and as a player, you have to find uh, a computer to escape. The apartment and then from there you can get to the factory building um, so once you're at the factory uh, you discover three spaces and there's the backstage uh, the main warehouse um, and then this mirror ballroom and the main warehouse um, includes an exhibition which you'll see the um, yeah, player wander around shortly 
but the exhibition is very much um, a reflection on how the physical world is becoming more dependent on cyberspace. So you see these still lives, which are like, mock-ups of bedrooms, kitchen islands, offices, uh, terminals. Um, and it's once again, it's very much around this tension between our personal life and, and, and cyberspace. So yeah, running around there. Um, and the panopticon in the middle, this riser, um, is used to look out across all these personal environments and these still lives. Um, and, you know, I think this operates on two different levels. One is uh, it can be used for virtual concerts and performances, which uh, we were seeing a lot of in lockdown, actually. Um, uh, but it's also um, sort of a panopticon which is empty. And uh, we talked a lot about this inability of virtual performances to recreate the IRL performances and actually that they made you feel quite lonely and isolated. So it's also about this kind of failure um, of, of the metaverse and, and the promise of the metaverse as well. So just some stills, this is backstage. This is, this is based on the building model that we have from the architects. And this is the, just a sort of more close up version of the riser with La Turbo in the middle and then the still lives that has wrapped around the space in a kind of 360. So all these secret, there were, you know, to make it exciting, there was also secret spaces that players can find. Um, and actually we had lots of conversations early on about how difficult uh, we should make it. And I have to say we went on quite a journey with La Turbo and we learned lots because we were like, you need to make it as easy as possible so people go, go to the end. But actually what we found is that the harder you made it, the more people would return and play. So it was a real journey for us actually to, to um, shift our thinking. Um, and I'm really glad that we, we had those debates and discussions because the people that returned, returned because yes, they couldn't get to the end. Um, so uh, to give you a sense of how many people um, access the work in the first week, uh, we had 1.5 million. Um, and then every week we had recurring people coming back and we still do. Um, and then we developed a choose your own adventure, which was really important for us because, um, oh, I'll just go here. We wanted to ensure that people who didn't play Fortnite um, could understand what the project was about because the project was more than just, um, we wanted it to exist beyond the game itself and it needed to translate to a, to a much wider audience. We developed um, a version uh, for web just using that like, user generated content. And obviously the in-game cin cinematography and, um, in, in Fortnite creative is, is, is really brilliant. So this is a, um, a really an adapted version for web, um, but it meant that certainly the people who would never normally go into Fortnite creative were, were able to access it. So within a couple of days, someone had a post on YouTube uh, um, how they got to the end, which was good to see. And for us, because this one was quite an experiment, we got some great feedback from um, yeah, lots of people that wouldn't normally engage with the festival, which was really brilliant. Um, and, you know, despite it being a really busy time in lockdown and lots of virtual exhibitions being launched, we did seem to cut through some of the press. Um, and, you know, and I think one of the things that made that was actually La Turbo being at the heart of it and that narrative around them being a virtual artist. Um, so, yeah, this is sort of some of the coverage we got in The Verge and, and Creative Review. Um, but just, just to sort of summarise some of the real highlights for us, were actually, it was actually um, during the construction of the work, um, during a time, because we were, we were actually making the work in lockdown, and um, during a time where we're actually um, saying no to site visits to the building and having to cancel various projects, it was actually really amazing that we could deliver this, and there wasn't very hopeful about it, so this was the Turbo, the Turbo's first site visit to the factory. Um, and I remember sending these pictures to the, our wider programming team and they were just so delighted by it. It was actually quite emotional. Um, this is them waving and arriving at the island. <laughs> um, 
but we couldn't have built the space without uh, working with a team called Team Create, who helped us construct the island. So they worked really closely with La Turbo. And for us, they were like future architects in the game world. And while La Turbo was able to, to do much of the build themselves, it was really useful to have this support. And they previously worked on uh, a few Fortnite creative islands and, and or also worked on the in-game performance uh, of Weezer um, in Fortnite. So they just had this um, really in-depth knowledge. And it was really through their expertise and their craftsmanship that we were able to construct the virtual impression of the factory. Um, and while the physical space um, actually um, is laid out quite similarly to, 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 the, to, to this space here, um, instead of thinking of uh, cement and scaffolding, we were thinking about digital storage. So actually, there are some elements of the building you don't see, um, and you only actually see the building from these fixed perspectives. And that's partly to do with is ensuring that we had enough storage to be able to build some of the game. Um, so there are so there are definitely um, features which resemble the origins of the original building, but there is a lot that uh, we were able to do in the virtual space, um, um, which was which was more open ended and 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 uh, and about infinite possibilities rather than a kind of fixed model that we worked with. So. So we've been running a series of, of events alongside the project, um, which has just been opening up really important questions for us as an, as an organisation who are really interested in this space and interested in commissioning video games and thinking about how we present them. Um, and I think one of the things that we've been really fascinated by is actually certainly working with Team Create and both the Turbos, how um, players express themselves and how they've contributed to a sense of a community and authorship over the game um, and also um, how they become architects of their own surroundings because of the fact that you can uh, direct your own narrative there through the in-game captures. And also in, in Fortnite Creative you, you have uh, the ability to build features so you can dictate your own rules. Um, and this is quite interesting to, for us to think about if uh, if you think about how that could work in, in, the, in, a, in a building like factory as well. Um, and alongside this, we've also been thinking about how you imagine the impossible and try not to build templates from in real life um, or mirror consumer architecture in virtual spaces. And I think this quote from La Turbo really um, talks to that. So um, when Second Life was introduced to the public, it was a fascinating experiment in understanding the tools and the liberty of a metaverse. A user could exist as a tree if they wanted, they could script and simulate a self that had no correspondence to what or who they were at the keyboard. Yet, as we can see now, it isn't long till virtual worlds default to the templates of Barbie and Barbie and Ken and the consumer architecture that people wanted to escape from in the first place. So I think this quote was actually really important to us when we were thinking about um, yeah, the worlds that we want to build and how we don't how we make them absolutely fabulous. Uh, and and inspired by this idea of infinite possibility rather than trying to mirror dynamics in the real world. Um, and so next stages for us are um, you know, thinking a lot about collective authorship and how we build a sense of belonging um, to, to, to the factory. Um, but we're also launching another project in February, by, uh, which will be, so, will be so different to this um, uh, uh, by Taishani. Um, but the project and the island uh, will be running now until the building opens. So we're beginning to think of different ways in which we can can keep it going. And we're also going to start thinking about how we archive it too. So um, yeah, watch this space. And uh, for the moment, I'm going to wrap up there. <clears throat> Stop screen, awesome. sharing my screen. Awesome, Gabrielle. Thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, your uh, your work and telling us more about this uh, this exciting project. Um, could you tell us uh, what size team did it take to to create uh, your progress will be saved? Was this built just by uh, La, Tur uh, La Turbo or was it a collaboration? And uh, yeah, and what skills and roles did you need to um, did you need to to create this uh, this space? Yeah, that's a really good question because um, 
we started thinking about we, we, we went into the project not really knowing what skills we needed actually so we had um we went with the reason we chose La Turbo is because they knew that world they knew the multiplayer world and that's that's half of the battle. Sometimes we work with artists who have no idea how to work in those spaces and that can make it really difficult. So um, it already it already really helped that Latoba knew how to build new all the considerations. And um, I also um, in my team we have um, there's two people and um, we had a very um, brilliant digital production coordinator um, who's, who's an avid Fortnite um, that player so he really knew what he knew also um he really supported that process um but we also uh, had a producer um and um and then team create so there's like one individual in in team create who worked with so it's a relatively small team um now what was really important to us um was that other people could access it so we did call on externals to test it so um from an accessibility perspective um and um, and in terms of user testing, um, we were using a lot of obviously what was already existed in Fortnite Creative, but we we certainly checked our own web presence to make sure that was all accessible. Um, but yeah, actually a relatively small team, but I think it would have required more had um, LaTurbo not understood how to build because it meant that they could go in on the island and change what needed to change. Whereas if you had somebody who didn't have that, you would probably need to, to, to scale up. Um, we were also really lucky in the fact that we um, were developing a project and we know we have an R&D project where we're working closely with Epic Games, um, who are obviously the, 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 the team behind Fortnite. And not that we but if you we were having problems or if we had questions, just general questions, we could we could also drop them along. Awesome. And uh, how long will this project stay stay online? Yeah, that's a really good question because we're debating that at the minute, and and we feel like it should go on till the building actually opens. Because when the building opens, it becomes something else. It's it's sort of redundant in this in the way that it is now, the way that it operates, and it changes the nature of the project. So you know, we're talking about if the because the building might not open till 22, it'll be running for a co at least another year and a bit. Awesome. And uh, <laughs> uh, do you want to, uh, are you thinking of uh, creating even more projects in, in Fortnite? <laughs> so in Fortnite Creative, we can do what, it, you know, we have a lot of flexibility. Um, uh, one of the things we've been approached to do is, is work with students actually so you know in lockdown when everyone was doing their degree shows and they had nowhere to put things and they were like okay we need to find a place where where people can see our exhibitions um we were getting asked whether whether the island was appropriate so i think one of the things we would like to look at is um ways in which lots of people could potentially create things um and so we are considering how we might evolve it but that will be in constant consultation with La Turbo and what La Turbo feels comfortable doing because it feels like it's also an artwork and it needs to form part of that conversation. Cool. So yeah, and the uh, the level of engagement was uh, and interest was really really phenomenal. Like uh, I've read that since July it has been visited for more than a million times. Um, but do you know like? What sort of audience uh, uh, visited actually uh, visited your progress will be saved? Like, are there uh, exclusively Fortnite players, game um, game um, gamers, or somebody completely not connected to, to games in, in any way? And how? And yeah, actually, like, what are, what are the the reactions to to this work? Yeah, is so so. To be honest, we didn't know how many we would get. And, uh, uh, and being really frank, we thought we probably wouldn't get very many people <laughs> um, because um, because it's not on the main island and, and in Fortnite Creative, you don't, it's not really clear how many, even though there's a global community, you don't know how many people um, use it. And so it was a bit of a, it was a risk for us, but it was, a, it was also as just understanding, yeah, like what you could do in those spaces. So it, it was a worthwhile risk. Um, and so we were like, like we were like so shocked when the when the figures came in, and we didn't even know that you could 
obviously we, we set it up so we, we we could track some of that but you're you, you're um you stop being able to track those numbers after a period of time so um which is which is really frustrating you get them for a month and then and that's about it um and so uh we could see who would come in the first week and then we can see return visits over another four weeks unless we do something new with it and then we get to put it on um, as a feature again so uh, yeah we were just like this is insane like we, we never expected this amount of people we were a bit like oh my god um and the information you get about it is is like how long people spend in there and um but we didn't get any information around like what you know who they are um and and where they're where they're from any of that and actually we had lots of internal conversations um about oh yeah but those people need to we need to get their data so that they can come to the real factory and you know we need that audience to come to the factory and and actually we were saying but they are going to the factory we don't need to bring them to the physical we need to we need to start thinking of actually that space is also a space which is equally as meaningful and valid as the physical space so um it was actually it opened up a whole set of very interesting conversations about the fact that an online audience doesn't need to translate into a physical person who might go through the door um but actually um you know in terms of our own um uh, uh we did an adaptation for the website so that the audiences we got for that are more you, the regular mif audiences um which is a super varied between 18 and 35 um so we don't know exactly the data around the four, the the players, but you could look at your average data around Fortnite players and and probably come up with a summary around it. But I think um, yeah, for us it was very much um, just a test, really a test in yeah. Who, who, does it does any if you put it out there, will anyone actually see it? Will anyone actually engage with it? Yeah, and we were delighted with the response. So um, yeah, we, well we should consider how we might evolve it and. and and see how we can track the figures going forward. Yeah, awesome. Can you please just share uh, once more to our audiences, like how can how can they visit um, uh, yeah. uh, your progress will will be saved? Yeah, so you can go to um, uh, virtual hyphen factory uk and then you will be able to get the link to the factory Fortnite um, site. So I can put it into the chat um, and then from there you're, there's the code to the island and then you just go straight from from that code. You need to register for an account, um, but um, but if you just want to play the ad adapted version for web, then um, you'd be able to go on that site. Also, and uh, uh, are there guided tours uh, uh, by La Turbo on, on Twitch as well? Yeah, there are. So La Turbo, I was actually going to include that in the presentation, but I thought um, it's quite lengthy. There's like a 20 minute tour of um, La Turbo um, from from their voice. Um, giving you a guide from the apartment to to, to, to the factory and um, yeah and it's and there's also a tour um, and a kind of workshop by uh, Team Create who helped us build the space so if anyone is just interested in in actually how to make the most of Fortnite Creative there's loads of tutorials out there online but we thought it was quite useful um, to do a real basic uh, tutorial um, so we've also got that on our, um, yeah on Twitch too. Awesome. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, could you tell us? Oh, mm, yeah. What spaces have been like most receptive to your to your work? Because it still feels like museums and galleries and also festivals. I know that you are like a big advocate for for festivals supporting em emerging talents. Um, so, uh, those engaging with video games is still something quite rare. So um, yeah, uh, how receptive do you find like uh, do you, do you find cultural institutions uh, to be when so it comes to, to such video games? games? Yeah, to video games in particular. Uh, so so just just to understand the question, to um, how receptive are festivals and cultural organisations to video games? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think some festivals are still honestly potentially don't understand video games and and uh, but I think that there's a real shift happening um, and I think we really we saw that um, very visibly I think in lockdown uh, with you know the phenomena of like Animal Crossing and and actually how people were getting 
uh, we're getting so much from these spaces that actually that they they like I say they, there was a sort of sense of belonging in and a, um, and um, and so I think cultural institutions in particular are beginning to recognise those spaces as spaces not only to create but um, uh, spaces of influence. Um, I think for 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 organisations like Manchester International Festival and the Factory, um, you know, we recognise video games creators as artists and um, of an equal level to any other artists that we work with, and um, and actually, uh, you know, it, for many of us who who have worked in that space for a period of time. Um, are really excited actually by the fact that we might be able to support a community that hasn't been um, put in, in, the, in that same platform as, as other art, art forms. Um, and so I think there's a real opportunity now moving forward about how can you, um, you know, how can we create a space which is super exciting, which is different actually to, to doing a sort of straight up exhibition or installation that brings in all that, um, the narrative, the world building, the interactivity, um, and I think there's loads that we can learn. I was saying this to Marie, there's, you know, there's loads that we can learn from that community uh, about how they talk about their projects, how they release them and, and test them with the, with the community. And, and we've got a great deal to learn, I think, as cultural organisations uh, from them. So, yeah, I think festivals, um, certainly um, across Europe, I think are becoming quite aware of, 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 of the increased interest in this space. Um, yeah. Awesome. And uh, in what ways do you think uh, might video games creatives like we've talked about like uh, game designers in in what ways can they work with uh, curators and museums and, and cultural institutions like what opportunities do you think the future might hold for collaborations? Because it, as you said uh, just now, yeah, they're opening up to the, this um, to working with, with video games and probably the, the pandemic is also pushing institutions um, um, yeah, to undertake uh, to be online. And um, so what do you think like that the, the future holds for video games uh, creators? Yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like I probably can't talk talk on behalf of the video game creators, but I can say what I can learn from them. Like, I think that they have this. There's a we can we can learn a lot about play and in, uh, in ways that we take ourselves very seriously <laughs> in cultural organisations and institutions. And um, and I think there's something really interesting um, about how you might scale up games into in, into more citywide uh, performative um, experiments. Um, I think there is amazing opportunities with all the in-game cinematography and, um, and capture tech that, that um, you know, really translates to, to film worlds, that translates to um, um, installations or large-scale immersive spaces, but also like you know, I, I think with the right kind of games designer and developer, you should be working closely with them on how you can think in a truly cross-platform way. Um, and actually, you don't necessarily get those for, get that kind of thinking from artists. Whereas I think that you know, from working with certainly working with some video game designers, they do think in that way. They think about actually what's the online community and uh, yeah, and what's that um, interactivity. Um, but yeah, I mean, we. I also think that there's there's massive potential when it comes to thinking about, um, you know, theatre. You know, we, we commission theatre a lot, and and we're often talking about immersive theatre, and um, and all of that actually is about some of it. It's definitely about gamifying particular environments. So I think that, you know these are other th these are other um, skills that I think video games designers some of them have. Um, so it really depends on what the games that people create, but I think, um, but I think there's loads of opportunities um, if they speak to the right people. Cool. And what are like the main, um, uh, if any, like um, ideas and inspirations that you would take from working within the virtual and bring that back into uh, real world uh, events and exhibitions? Yeah. Well, I think a major thing for us is. Um, 
the, we always, and especially at, at Manchester International Festival, is we are terrible at going, keeping hold of a project and like keeping it really silent and then going, boom, premiere, here you go. And actually, I think um, what I would love to take from some of the game projects, certainly like the virtual projects, is do a lot more beta testing and do all of that dev testing, like, you know, do loads of tests beforehand and then launch it so you build in a community as you go along. So rather than keeping it really top secret for ages, actually um, uh, talking about it a lot earlier and getting audiences and players involved in it earlier. Um, I'd love to think about how we can do that in different ways with, with more, um, I guess, more of our traditional shows um, and, and traditional productions. Um, but I think also there's, um, uh, it, it happens in different ways, but I also think that things that we could take into the physical, into into the virtual would be rituals. Like I think in the physical space, when we do a lot of theatre, there's the, um, or for VR in particular, you know, onboarding and offboarding is quite a ritual of like entering a space, putting something on. And I think there's something that we don't do very well online, which is the the, the onboarding, the ritual of, of entering a particular location online. And I think it's interesting to think about that a bit more, how you can how you can uh, top and tail experiences. Um, it's often like press play, start, <laughs> whereas, you know, it's sl slightly unimaginative. Um, so I think, yeah, we can do a bit more of that too. Awesome, thanks. And uh, for the end of this session, could you uh, shed some more uh, light on um, on your f future project? Like, what wh what are the next steps um, for you and for the and for the factory? Yeah. So so we've got um, we've got another project um, that forms part of Virtual Factory with um, the artist Toshani, um, and that's completely different and really out there and um, and it's very much around the architecture of experience and taking people on this psychedelic journey um and um yeah and use it really using this idea of the mind as a as a as a place to explore um and um so we're working on that and that's quite a complex uh, piece of work and you know and also thinking about how that work translates online it, it takes quite a bit of time for us to think about um, but we're also um, planning the festival next year. And um, so for us, we're doing a lot of <laughs> contingency planning of, you know, how do you do a festival um, in a time uh, where, you know, we, we don't know what the scenario will be. Hopefully it'll be, um, we'll have a vaccine and everything will be okay. But uh, we're, we're planning a blended festival where there'll be things online and in, and in a physical space. And uh, we're hoping at that point, Robert Yang's video game will be ready so we'll be launching that within within that context and uh, yeah and Robert's project is really exciting Robert is collaborating with um, an illustrator um, and so it's going to look very different um, in terms of aesthetic and style to his previous works so um, yeah we've got a lot of projects in the pipeline and um, just trying to keep them on track um, during this during lockdown it's been quite difficult <laughs> Awesome, awesome, Gabriel. We wish you all the all the all the luck in the world with your <laughs> projects, and we're uh, yeah, um, we will be waiting for um, for some new information uh, from you on those. Uh, yeah, but fingers crossed that pandemic doesn't affect you in in any way anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk and um, for introducing us to this. Um, to your work and to this really exquisite project. We have shared a link uh, in the comments um, uh, to our audiences, uh, to our audience uh, so they can visit, uh, so they can visit your progress will be saved. Now also don't forget to check out details of the Play UK mentorship program. Uh, applications are open from now on until uh, 5 p.m. Uh, on the on the 10th of December, so you have like two weeks to uh, you have two two weeks to apply and we have posted a link with more information in the chat uh, and you can also find that info on uh, play UK section on the British Council website 
And um, also please join us again on this on 9th of December for our next uh, Play UK Speaker Salon, where we will be joined by Luke Whitaker and Catherine Bidwell, um, founders of award-winning UK game studio State of Play. They will be talking about how their new narrative, um, about their new narrative adventure game, uh, South of the Circle. Uh, Gabrielle, thank you again and uh, thank you all for your time and see you on 9th of December. Bye.